hymn is hymn number 75. Hymn number 75, O Come, All Ye Faithful. And of course, we'll be excluding uh, stanza number six.
and say that we are very blessed indeed to have you with us. Before our service continues, of course, as AIM begins, we do uh, remind ourselves from time to time that we are surrounded by a community of saints, those who were once a part of our lives and who have gone on to their eternal rest. So at this time, I'm going to invite you to be seated, and I'm going to call on Phyllis Doss, who is the chair of our altar or sanctuary guild, and she's going to uh, name those who have been meant being remembered at this time by way of donations to flowers, the beautiful flowers that you see at the back here. So when you're ready, so thank you. The place in church this Christmas is not in memory of the following. Shirley Billard, Bertha and James Smith, Martin and John Spurl, sisters and brothers, Maura Skippington, George Spurl and loved ones, Ted Lethbridge, Doreen Short, Artie Elliott, Owen Hiscock, Lois and Effie Porter, May and Frank Hiscock and loved ones, Fred Goss, Gord Late, William and Selena Goodger, Clarice Fuhr and loved ones, John Moores and loved ones, John Mercer, Effie and William Evely, Evely, Edith and George Mercer, Phyllis Mithral, Justin Ingram, Jennifer Ingram, Felix and Ann Russell, Samuel Bokey, Clyde Bokey, Beth Tucker, and loved ones. Rest, Rest eternal, grand unto them, O Lord, and let light of the shine upon them. Amen. 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 Thank you, Phyllis. 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 Her mom, uh, Iris, and they're going to lead us in the lighting of the Advent wreath. I wonder, did you get this booklet when you came in? Did any of you get the booklet? Yes. You did? Okay. And of course, we go to the Christ candle Christmas Eve. This time last year, the candle, this is the last time this year that we will light the Advent candles. For four weeks, the candles have been burning as we thought about hope, peace, joy, and love. These are the gifts which Jesus brought to us at Christmas time. Our waiting is over. Jesus is born. Each week, another candle glowed and our wreath shone more brightly. Today we light the white candle which represents Jesus. It is in the center of the wreath, just as Jesus is the center of our lives. Happy birthday, Jesus. Let us pray together. God, our hearts sing with joy and praise because of Jesus. At this happy season, we rejoice that Jesus came among us. By his birth and life, he has shown us that we are your people and that we are greatly loved. Help us to remember this Christmas all year long by giving the presence of life, love, hope, peace, joy, kindness, and understanding Amen. And I invite you now to turn to the back of your bulletin and we're going to sing together stanza number five. We like this candle.
words to stand as we turn to page 185 and begin our liturgy of Holy Eucharist. <laughs> the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. I invite you now to turn to the collect of the day. It's printed in your bulletin. They're in the bold. Together we pray, Eternal God, this holy night is radiant with the brilliance of your one true light. As we have known the revelation of that light on earth, bring us to see the splendor of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you now to be seated as Emily comes and blesses us with a vocal number entitled, Do You Hear What I Hear?
The first reading is taken from Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 2 to 7. The people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us, Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this evening is Psalm 96, to be found on page 834. Uh, we will say the psalm responsively by the half verse, and together the prayer at the end. Please stand. Page 834. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations. And his wonders among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is more to be feared than all gods. As for all the gods of the nations, they are but idols. But it is the Lord who made them. Oh, the majesty and magnificence of his presence. Oh, the power and splendor of his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, you families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord honor and power. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name. Bring offerings and coming to his court. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let the old earth tremble before him. Tell it out among the nations, the Lord is king. He has made the world so firm that it cannot be moved. He will judge the evils with equity. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea thunder and all that is in it. Let the field be joyful and all that is there. 
Then shall all the trees of the wood shout for joy before the Lord when he comes. When he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness. And the people with his truth. Together, we, we worship you God the glory in the beauty of all this, and we joyfully proclaim your just and righteous rule, established for all through your Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Life reading is from Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, trying us to renounce empathy and worthless passion, and in the present age to live lives that are self controlled, upright, and godly, while we wait for the blessed hope and the manifestation of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is, he is it who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all equity and purify for himself a people of his own, who are sinners for good deeds. And the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our graduate hymn is hymn number 734, hymn 734. Mm. Because there was no place for them in the inn. 
In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who went and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We would all agree that the story of Jesus' birth, as related by St. Luke in today's Gospel reading, is the story of a promise that was made and a gift that was given. The idea certainly lies at the heart of the Christian message. The Hebrew scriptures provide ample evidence of God's promise to the world. The Bible tells us that God made a promise with the Jews, establishing a covenant with his chosen people. God's promise to the Hebrews to make them a great nation reached its apex in David the great king of the united Israel. Peace was present, and Israel stood above other nations. Unfortunately, Israel's posi position was short-lived due to the faithlessness of its people. Immediately after Solomon's death, the nation divided, and antagonism reigned between Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Despite this situation, God's promise to the Hebrews continued to be fulfilled. As rulers in both nations transgressed God's law, prophets were sent to warn the people. Ezekiel was sent to the Hebrews in exile with a message of Israel's return. God would breathe new life into the dead bones of Israel and give them another chance. And we read about that in Ezekiel 37, 1 to 14. Isaiah was sent to proclaim a good day for Israel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and release to the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Undoubtedly, the greatest fulfillment of God's faithfulness to the Hebrews was the promise of the Messiah. And God's faithfulness to the Hebrews should, of course, be no surprise to the Christian community. We recall Paul's letter to Timothy in chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. 
If we endure, we will also reign with him. Listen to the second part. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. The highest point in God's plan of salvation, my friends, is found in Jesus Christ. The ultimate manifestation of God's promise to his people, you and I. As we heard last Sunday, the angel Gabriel came to Mary with a remarkable claim that she, a virgin, would conceive and bear a son. Today we hear of the angel's promise being fulfilled, being fulfilled in Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. The Son of God, sent by the Father, takes on human condition in an act of ultimate love for you and I. God left his throne in heaven and came as a helpless baby in a manger, knowing that he was going to be nailed to a cross to die for your sins and mine. That is the ultimate love, the unconditional love of the Christmas story. The familiar Christmas story that we hear each and every year at this time presents, as I said earlier, a promise fulfilled and a gift given. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of Isaiah and the other prophets. But the Lord's presence is a great gift as well. It is through Jesus' presence among us that God's plan for our salvation reaches its final act. Jesus' birth in history is the beginning of the final chapter in God's loving plan to save the world. St. Paul expresses this powerfully in his letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man, which is Adam, one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, and that includes you and I, so by one man's obedience, the many, including you and I, were made righteous. Jesus is the second Adam. The second Adam who enters the world as a defenseless child, yet at the same time is King and Lord. The key to human salvation has come. Jesus will announce the kingdom. He will be rejected and crucified, but he will rise again. Thus the final chapter of God's plan begins. The world must rejoice that our salvation is near at hand. Jesus' birth into human history, the event for which we have waited during our Advent journey, must be a source of great rejoicing, for it initiates the goal for which you and I were created. Do you ever wonder why you were created? Do you ever think about that? The goal for which you and I were created was our return to God. When you and I were born, God breathed life into us. And when we leave this world, that goes back to God. But what does this event that happened more than 2,000 years ago mean for you and I today? It must be much more than a remembrance of an historical event. But what should it be? Jesus is the greatest gift God ever gave to the world. But since we're here tonight celebrating his birthday, should we not be thinking about what gift we can give to the newborn King of Kings? After all, in our society, we celebrate one's birthday by giving that person a gift, don't we? And whenever our birthday comes, we look forward to receiving a gift. 
if we're honest about it, if we don't get one, we're a little bit disappointed. Possibly, the gift we can give is greater and more fervent commitment to God in prayer. Prayer, our communication with God, is absolutely essential to our lives. Prayer is as vital as the food and drink we consume and the air that we breathe. But somehow it often does not hold much priority in our lives. I don't know about you, but oftentimes during the day I think about how much time I spend on the phone. Talking to this one, talking to that one, talking to somebody else, listening to this one, listening to that one, listening to somebody else. And when I get a few moments, I sit down and I say, Dear Lord, I've talked to everybody else today, but I haven't really gotten around to talking to you. And I really need to. St. Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 tells us that we must pray without ceasing. Too often we make excuses why we don't pray. Oftentimes we pray. I read somewhere not too long ago that people go to God like they go to a doctor when they get sick. Or people go to God like they go to Santa when they want something. And it really made me think. But oftentimes we make excuses for not praying. I'm too busy. It's not my style. I feel awkward. I don't really know what to say. And when people say that to me, I don't really know what to say. I say to them, just talk to God the same way you talk to somebody else. That's all that's necessary. Maybe our gift to the Lord this Christmas could be a commitment to pray and to stop making excuses for our failures. Our gift to Jesus might be a renewal of a relationship gone sour. Life is so complex that our relationships often become strained and we are too proud or we do not possess the strength or will to mend those that are afraid. It may be that our relationship with a family member has gone sour. A friend down the street Maybe we haven't spoken to him or her in a long time. A strained relationship with a co-worker. What a wonderful gift for Jesus to know that we had made a significant effort to make a relationship that's gone wrong right again. Renewing our attitudes and opinions that are inconsistent with our Christian lives would be another great gift to consider. All of us, my friends, regardless of who we are, holds hurts and grudges that sour us on individuals and groups. Can we do our best to wipe the slate clean and begin anew? <laughs> Maybe we can consider modifying or even eliminating habits that are troublesome for others or ourselves. Addictive behavior of any mode is destructive and hurtful to all. Can we right our personal ship and get it sailing in safer waters? If we are open to changing long-held ways of doing things, ways that might not be the best, if we make these things right, that is the best gift that we can give to our Lord. Possibly, our gift to Jesus can be greater involvement in building his kingdom through ministry in the church, like all these young people I mentioned earlier. Certainly, God's people have many needs. Can we use some of the time, the talent, and the treasure that we have been given and return some for the betterment of others, as Jesus did? What was it one little girl said tonight? Jesus healed the sick and he made the blind man see, and she went on and on and on. It was amazing just how much she knew. Certainly the Lord would be pleased with any of these gifts and many more besides. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise, initiated originally with Abraham, and Jesus is the greatest gift as well. What 
can we do for Jesus? What can we provide to make his kingdom in our world? The challenge is great. And God is waiting for our response. Merry Christmas.
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Stand. <laughs> the peace of the Lord be always with you. Take some time to extend the peace of Christ to each other.
You will find the prayer over the gifts printed in your bulletin. Together we pray. Source of light and gladness, accept all we offer on this joyous feast. May we grow up in him who unites our lives to yours. For we is Lord, now and forever. Amen. Tonight we'll be using Eucharistic prayer number three, found on page 198. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks for grace. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who in the mystery of his incarnation was made perfect man of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, his mother. In him we have seen a new and radiant vision of your glory. Therefore, with all the angels of heaven, we lift our voices and sing our joyful hymn of praise to proclaim the glory of your name.
For the breaking of the bread, we will be using sentence number six on page 213. We break the bread of life, and that light is the light of the world. God, here among us, light in the midst of us, bring us to light and life. My dear friends, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Thank you.
We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My dear friends, may the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all those whom you love, this night and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Before we have our closing hymn, I just want to <coughs> take this opportunity on behalf of Carl and myself to wish you all a very joyous, blessed, and merry Christmas and a very healthy, happy new year. We want to thank you, each and every one of you, for all the love and support that you um, bring our way throughout the our closing hymn, but you notice in your bulletin that after our closing hymn, St. Mary's Choir is going to sing Christmas Peace before Reverend Sheila gives the dismissal. Our closing hymn is number 77. Number 77. <laughs>
Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. The worship is over. The service is